Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guest is a rule breaker. She is a trailblazer, and most importantly, she is an inspiration. In 1989, she sailed across the world with the first ever all-female crew and was also the first woman to ever receive the Yachtsman of the Year trophy. Tracy Edwards' story is told beautifully in Alex Holmes' new documentary, complete with incredibly compelling footage of her voyage. Let's take a look at Maiden. For me, sailing was about freedom. It was freedom of everything. It was leaving everything behind. My father died when I was 10. My parents instilled in me a sense of determination. So when I heard about the Whitbread Around the World race, it was just something I had to do. Sailing at that time was very male-dominated. There were just no women anywhere in it. The Whitbread Round the World race at 33,000 miles is the longest and most challenging on Earth. I wanted to be part of this. I remember going to the skipper, and he went, we're not going to be the only racing team in the world with a girl. And that's when I made the decision to put an all-female crew into the race. I didn't want a real job. I wanted adventure. And I just thought that would be fantastic. I was going to do everything I could to do it. We didn't really take it seriously. There was nothing to show that they would be acknowledged for anything other than failure. I was so full of doubt and fear. All I was thinking was, am I the right person to do this? Three, two, one. The Whitbread race is underway. We weren't naive. We knew it was going to be hard. We didn't think they would even finish the first leg. It was something that we were told we couldn't do, but we were doing it anyway. It was the first time in my life I had stood up for something I believed in. And the harder it became, the more I wanted to do it. As we were finishing the first leg, I said, is that loads of little birds over there? And then we realized it's thousands of people. They were not there for us. <laughs> How many times we told we couldn't do it? You're not strong enough. You're not skilled enough. You'll all die. It was brilliant. Just completely overwhelming. <laughs> what if I tell you about a young girl who had a dream about sailing around the world? What if I tell you that it did happen? Everybody, please welcome director of Maiden Alex Holmes and the Maiden's captain, Tracy Edwards. Let's hear it. Thank you. <laughs> I just said uh, Maiden's captain, but I actually don't know if it was actually referred to as the captain while you were on the on the ship. Was it captain? Skipper. Not? Skipper, thank you. <laughs> I knew that. Like, I just watched the movie, and in my head, it's like, captain's going to work better for the introduction. But I knew it was going to be like, someone was going to go, it's not captain, dude, it's skipper. I, I love this film. It's such a beautiful story. It's so inspiring. Um, hearing you and your other your shipmates talk about what you went through and the determination that you had, it's hard not to finish watching it and be like, okay, I'm gonna go live my dreams now. Um, so let's talk about how how the film came together. Alex, when did you get this footage? When did you start working on it? What prompted you to start working on it? How did you meet Tracy? Uh, I first met Tracy five years ago now, uh, or almost to, to the week uh, five years ago. Uh, my daughter was leaving elementary school. She was uh, 11 years old. And uh, the school had uh, invited uh, a local speaker to, to, to come and talk to the children and give them some words of advice about, you know, to move on with. And that <laughs> guest speaker was Tracy Edwards. Um, Did you know Tracy's story pr prior to that? You know, I, I think that I was leaving college when Tracy was sailing around the world. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> well, no, we were not too far apart. <laughs> no, rub it in. <laughs> uh, and I think my mind was elsewhere. Uh, but, you know, the minute Tracy started telling the story to this, you know, group of enthralled 11-year-olds and the parents who'd come to, 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 to this evening event, I, I knew there was a film in it. It was just so clear. Tracy's such a compelling character. Uh, and the story was so inspiring and, and, and moving. Um, uh, I, in fact, by the time she'd finished, I was convinced that actually it must have already been made into a film. I just missed it. Um, so I went up to her afterwards and said, has this been made into a movie? Because if not, we should definitely do that. Would you be interested? And you already had, I mean, what a chance encounter because you already had a sort of a fair amount of films under your belt. You directed television, you've directed documentaries prior to this. So it's not like you were approached by someone who's like, I want to make documentaries. Can I make yours? <laughs> you actually could get it made. Yeah, but, you know, Tracy didn't know who I was. So, you know, that, that first approach is always, you know, absolutely, you know, innocent, isn't it? You know, you just go up and say, I, I love your story. Thanks for telling it. I'd love to turn it, love to share it with a wider audience, basically. How lucky did you feel when you, when she said yes, and then you got your hands on all this 
amazing footage well, of these just inspiring young women sailing. It's it's unreal. Yeah, Lucky is is right <laughs> uh, in so many ways. But but the but the surprising thing was first of all when she told it, I the, the film I saw unfurling in my head literally that first evening was a dramatic film. Uh, you know, as you say, I've worked in drama and in documentary. And I assumed that because this happened back in 89 and that was before small cameras and uh, before the, certainly before the invention of uh, you know, phone cameras when everything is filmed, um, you know, I assumed that... Even video then was kind of right, like, video, like beta decks kind of thing. Kind of thing. Great yeah. big thing. But, um, so I assumed that we would have to write a script and you know, cast it and, and you know, spend quite a bit of money uh, you know, recreating this, this incredible journey. Did um, you start doing that? N n well, no, because fortunately, only a couple of days later, Tracy pointed out she she <laughs> could see my she could see the route I was heading in and corrected me straight away and said, "You did know we had two cameras on board the whole way around," <laughs> and it was like, "Wow, that was the best news I could have heard because you know my first love is documentary and it was a great way to tell the story." You know, Tracy, one of my uh, favorite moments in the in the documentary is when you are on a um, a talk show and you're kind of fundraising to to sort of to to get the ship to be able to get out into the water and you're being interviewed by a woman who was still sort of talking to you in this very patronizing manner and says something along the lines, if I remember correctly, like, look at you, a little woman. You're going to get out there in the sea? And what was it like at this time? You're, you're clearly such a dedicated person. You were so dedicated to the point where people were kind of scared of you, they said. And yet you're still being interviewed. You're still being talked to as this, 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 this little woman who could never get it done. Well, that was one of the first interviews I ever did, and I was about 23 years old. So I had no media training, and I have two gears, either very angry, going to kill you, or um, I'm just going to forget that you ever said that. Is that <laughs> then, or is that, do you still operate in those two gears? A milder version Watch out. of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know how to react, and they made me up to look like this dolly bird. I mean, a hair from I don't know what, and all this makeup, and I felt very uncomfortable. Um, but I was being interviewed by a woman, so I felt safe. And then when she came out with this, you know, oh, you're going to take lots of waterproof mascara, That's instead of ripping her throat out, I thought, That's not going to be a good look. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go, Oh, yeah, which I did, which I hate now when I look at it. And then Oh, I love it because I think you come off as so graceful <laughs> and not in the way of not in the way of like a, a you know, the way that we use that about about women all the time, but I mean you come off as very poised and like you are handling her condescension very well. Like if you're looking closely, you can read in your eyes <laughs> how annoying it is, but you are you you are handling it quite well. Thank you. I mean, I, I do have to say that one of the things that's really come out of the film for me and watching the documentary 30 years after we did this is that I remember myself as being a bit of an idiot, you know, a bit of a twit. And so I see my younger self in my mind's eye as someone I'm quite embarrassed about who was unable to control certain elements of her character. And I, I um, don't think I ever really said anything that sensible. I think I just lurched from one situation to another. But then watching this film, I'm watching this young person up on the screen, and I'm going, who are you? Because I do say, actually, a couple of sensible things. Yeah. And there is this calm going on. But I know what's going on behind the surface, which is this panic a lot of the time while I'm being interviewed, um, and frustration at the questions. So I, I, I'm... Uh, uh, it, this documentary for me is a revelation. To do what you did at that time requires an incredible amount of drive and persistence that I think is almost blind in a, in a lot of ways. I'm wondering when you think back to that time or that moment, do you wonder who that person was, not just because of you know what you see in the documentary, but just about that blind drive and ambition that you had. Was that just a, one part of your life or did that continue after that? That's, I think... Probably that was me before Maiden, but I didn't know myself before Maiden. And also I had no goal. So what, and also I didn't start Maiden as this big, you know, feminist, women's, you know, thing. I started it for a very selfish reason, which was, you know, I did the 85, 86 ra race with 17 men. People say to me, why did you do an all-female crew? I'm like, do I need to say anything more? <laughs> it was a long and smelly journey, believe me. Uh, so I did Maiden <laughs> because I didn't want to be a cook on a boat. I wanted to navigate, which is my passion. It's what I do best. 
So I thought, well, the world looks like that. I don't like the way the world looks. I'm going to have to change it so I can change my bit of it. Which I'd imagine, like, if I thought that a female questioner on a talk show was condescending and patronizing, 17 men on a boat with, with one woman were probably far worse at times. Yeah, if you can survive that, you can survive anything, believe me. Um, they definitely... Um, it was an interesting time, but they taught me everything I needed to know for my next part of my journey. And that's always been the case in my life. I have come across the most extraordinary mentors and teachers. I'm so lucky. Um, and they were actually quite supportive when I decided to put Maiden together. I think they'd realized I was quite small, but quite tough. And, um, but what really shocked me was when I announced that we were going to do this all-female crew, said that I could be the navigator. There, was, there wasn't just a, we don't think you'll be able to do it. There was a real... Uh, and this is so hard to remember 30 years ago. My daughter does say, you know, mum, it can't have been that bad. This documentary, thank you, has persuaded my daughter it was that bad. Um, and there was this anger, this, you you mustn't do this. What? And and, and my favourite, you will die. <laughs> what? Not you might die, but you will die. Uh, okay. And that is your problem how? Surely that's our problem, you know? <laughs> So it was a surreal experience, and I think what it did do was it made me think, you know what, this is not just about me navigating. This is about proving that women can race around the world, because I'd raced around, and it's not that hard. So it was like a world's best-kept secret, that one. Um, and Sailing I, around the world isn't that hard? If I can do it, seriously. <laughs> Uh, so, well, it wasn't as hard as the guys made it out to be. You know, they, they'd come back and they'd go, oh, it's really tough out there. Of course, that's what guys do. Oh, yeah. that was so hard. Please, <laughs> someone take care of me. <laughs> Get me a beer. Well, when we used to sail into port, we, we didn't want to be male clones. And I think a lot of times women have to become quite male to get to the top. And that's hard. And we wanted to prove that we are girly girls. So when we sailed into port, um, we would save some fresh water for the day before, shave our legs, under the arms, hair, you know, we'd mix, mascara. Mickey would braid our, braid our hair and we'd have one set of clean clothes. And when we sailed in, we looked like we just sailed around the corner. <laughs> and and the, <laughs> the guys looked like they'd been out there for years. Ah! You know? <laughs> How did you go about um, assembling assembling the crew? I would love to say that there was a plan yeah. to any of this, really. Um, but So I had no boat, no money, not really much idea of what I was doing in that part of the, sort of the planning. Girls kept hearing about this, and women arrived from all over the world. I would literally knock on my door, there'd be some strange woman standing there, and she'd say, can I join or can I help or whatever, and I, I'd say, you can help. Um, we had a crew house, so women would come and live in the crew house. They'd work. Some would leave, some would stay. And the girls that ended up on the crew were the ones that put up with not being paid, sometimes on time, sometimes ever, sometimes not being fed because I couldn't afford to, having to go and get a second job so that they could help me build the boat so that we could sail around the world. I mean, these women were committed. And they were pretty much the ones we ended up with. So they kind of chose themselves. And you were also, according to testimony in the documentary, you yourself were quite difficult at times on the boat. Shocking. I, I am not an easy person to uh, to live with. Um, I've been married twice, and both of my husbands will tell you that. Well, I mean, aren't we all? Like, uh, yeah. we're all quite difficult, I think, in our own ways. I think focused and driven people are particularly annoying, and I know I can be very annoying, but... I needed to be so focused on what we were doing, and uh, I think my crew forgave me for a lot. But then, you know, I think you love your friends despite their idiosyncrasies, and we all supported each other 100%. Um, In a way, though, you were also giving your crew a lot. I mean, this was your baby, this was your idea. So while maybe they were putting up with, as you said, a lot, they were also getting so much more out of this thing that you shepherded. Well, I think really the, um, the stressful period was getting to the start line. Right. But that, in a, it, that was also an advantage because by the time we got to the start line, we'd been through three years of hell. We had crawled over broken glass. We had built our own boat pretty much. So we were a team battle-hardened and ready to go. We looked at some of the other boats, and they were all shiny and nice, you know, and some of the guys had just turned up the day before. And we were looking at them going, 
<laughs> you know. So we were ready to go. We were, and that when we crossed the start line, that's when we all we became this amazing team who supported each other. And I calmed down because this is the bit we knew we could do. The bit before was the hard bit. Uh, one of the things that I love that you do in the documentary, and I, and I wonder if it just has to do with because of the footage that you had and the people that you're interviewing, is that your documentary says so much about what it means to be um, a woman trying to accomplish something in a male-dominated field without ever actually saying it that much. It just happens to be the story. And when you hear men talk about how they felt about them doing it, that tells the story as well. No one ever stops and says, well, this is what it's like for women in all these different fields. Can you talk about how the story itself allowed you to show this rather than sort of tell it? Because obviously that's what the documentary is all about. Well, the job was made much easier for me because uh, basically the first time I heard Tracy tell this story, that, that was the story. The story didn't change. Uh, you know, she, it, it worked for a group of 11-year-olds. It worked for the, the, the enthralled parents. You know, that was a good story. Don't, don't, don't mess with don't, If it, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, so I knew it was a good story from the start. What I, you know, what I didn't, there were two things that really uh, gave me an advantage in being able to, as you say, show the story rather than just tell it. Um, the first was, um, that I had this amazing footage. Um, it was amazing that there was, although it was scattered to the four winds and took us two years to kind of collect it all back together or, or collect as much of it as we could find back together, it was amazing footage. It was incredibly dramatic, uh, incredibly evocative of, of what it was like to be on board. It was great portraiture of these characters because there, there were a couple of other boats that did have cameras on board, some of the, 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 the boats with, with, with male crews. The footage that came off those boats was not nearly so interesting or so good from a filmmaking point of view as as was the boat from from uh, uh, as was the footage from Maiden because they, it was just shot with a completely different sensibility uh, than what you saw on the other boats. This was sort of proper uh, observational filmmaking that was going on on Maiden, partly because they had a plan and they had practiced it before they left, as well as practicing the sailing. Um, so that was the first advantage. And then the other the other advantage I had was that. Basically, I, I, well, I, I'm going to tell your story, Tracy. That, that that when I asked Tracy about would she agree to have her story told, she said, "Well, it's it's not just my story. It's it's our story. It's the story of all the crew, and I'm going to check with them first before I uh, give you an answer." And they had thankfully said yes. Let let's let's go for this. Their question back to Tracy was, "How honest should we be?" <laughs> and Tracy's answer, thank thankfully, was, "Let's let's let's be honest. Let's tell it all, warts and all." And what that enabled me to do was get unbelievably candid interviews with the with the crew, who talked about not just the not just the highs, but also the stresses and the strains, how difficult it was, what the challenges were, um, and you know I think that that allowed me to unpack the experience for them, uh, to actually put them in interviewing them, to put them back into the moment, and to get them to relive those moments, so that the the, the pressures that they were under became apparent just in the interviews themselves, rather than just a story of something that happened a long time ago. You know, um, uh, in the final moments of the film, and I said it during the intro, so I don't think it's that big of a spoiler, plus, you know, it's documented history. <laughs> uh, but you're awarded Yachtsman of the Year trophy uh, after, after your sailing venture, and it's in a beautiful moment, and you, uh, at that age, were 23, 24? Uh, no, so I was 27. 27. Don't know what to say. Uh, you don't have you don't have really words for the moment. If you could go back then to that moment, do you know what you would say? Have you ever thought about that moment again and thought about what you what you want to say? What I said next. Sorry, what I said next, which was to thank my amazing team. Mm. That's it. Yeah, I mean, I I pretty much said it all. I mean, I know I said I don't know what to say, but if it, it goes on from there, and uh, it's basically saying that I couldn't have done this without my team, that they supported me and they accepted me for how I was. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware, as I say, I'm not an easy person to uh, be around sometimes. And uh, that we needed each other. I keep saying you're not an easy person to be around. You seem delightful, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <know> it's better. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, she is. She's absolutely a joy to have in your life. <laughs> Were, did you and your team keep in touch after after the voyage, or was it kind of like, that's done, let's go our separate ways for, for a while, or did you remain bonded together? You, you cannot go through something like that and not be bonded 
forever. I mean, till death do you part, really. Um, I, they are my strongest friendships that I've pretty much made ever in my life. There are a few others, um, just in case anyone's watching this. Uh, but it's, it, you have risked your lives together, and, and there's nothing quite like that. And you've also seen sides of each other that you hope you will never talk about with someone else. You know, what, what happens on board stays on board. Uh, in a lot of cases, we didn't film everything. And um, you see each other at very vulnerable moments. So you see a very good friend or a colleague in the moment of fear, um, of, of extreme anxiety. You are you're very vulnerable as, as people, and you see that in each other, and you can't then go back into normal life and, and not have that uh, amazing experience that you had together. So we stayed in touch from day one uh, when we all sort of split and went our separate ways. Now you have these two cameras on board. Were you ever afraid of that vulnerability being captured on camera simply because you were the first all-female crew and you didn't really want anybody to see a vulnerable side of you sailing? Do you know I never actually contemplated that, but then I also didn't know exactly how much Joe was shooting. Because there is some stuff that when I've looked at the documentary, I've gone, was she sitting in the cupboard to get that shot? And I think what happened was we told her to go away in not such nice language so many times. You know, we turn around, they pick her and we go, Joe, go away! That I think she learned little secret ways of filming us, you know, when we didn't realise we were being filmed. And I am filmed in a couple of quite vulnerable moments, which I don't know if I would have had a problem with at the time, but I, I didn't think about it. Uh, and we did, you know, we, we were so trusting. We took all this footage and then we handed it to the race committee at each of the stopovers. Of course, you don't know what's on the camera. It's not digital. And then we just let it go. I mean, it, it, it freaks me out now when I think about it. You know, thank God it was Alex that found it. You know? Well, it's a different time. People were, even with a camera in their face, were far less camera conscious and mm. conscious of how they would be portrayed or cut or you know edited yeah. together later it's just like well that person's doing their job and i'm going to do my job i guess yeah. and then later you see a really mean documentary about yourself or something not let's hope that doesn't thing. happen you have got the footage safe haven't you i have yeah, i've okay. got it safe <laughs> uh let's get some questions from audience who has a question right here hi um what do you hope people will take after watching this film uh well, what i hope people take is is the sensation that I got the very first time I heard Tracy tell the story, which is that uh, I, I felt inspired, I felt um, I felt emboldened, I felt like uh, that the, here was an object lesson how if you follow your dreams and you keep moving forward, that you will achieve great things. Maybe not what you set out to achieve, but 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 something interesting will happen. Uh, so uh, that inspiration, I think, is something I'd like people to take away, but also. Uh, something else from that first evening when I heard Tracy tell the story uh, I think is important, which is that I was shocked um, to realize as I heard Tracy tell the story uh, in, in, you know, really to my 11-year-old daughter that a lot of the obstacles that Tracy faced uh, 25, 30 years ago uh, would be faced by my daughter. Uh, all this time later, and you know that was a real shock to me, uh, uh, just to have that, that 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 brought home so intensely in that moment. And so for me, it became a, a film that I wanted to tell, not just because it was an inspiring and beautiful story, but also because I think it's an important story that we have to keep this conversation going. We have to find new ways of breaking down those barriers, so that that for maybe for my daughter's generation, uh, you know, there will be more opportunity, there will be more equality, there will be more access to resources, uh, which will enable. Uh, people of, of, of all genders, all races, um, uh, to, 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 to pursue their dreams. Because only if we open the world up like that does the world become a better place. And if it's not opened up, they'll have no fear in knocking that door down to, to, to try to no. accomplish it. Yeah. Uh, next question. Hi, Tracy. You are just so incredibly inspiring. And so I was wondering if you had some advice for the young women out there who um, are facing similar adversity or just... Um, other newscasters who talk down to them. Yeah, that's. Um, I think it's really interesting that um, I think things have got better. Uh, of course, they have got better in 30 years. You know, one of the greatest things that's happened in 30 years are men are now part of this conversation. 30 years ago, they weren't. There's a there's an equality, a gender parity conversation going on between men and women, and and that to me is a wondrous thing. Long may that continue. Um, 
I am slightly worried that two of the young women, so I'm, we're sailing Maiden around the world again, and we've restored her, and I know she's, we ha she has a younger, fitter crew on her now. Um, all female crew, uh, less, less creaky than us. And uh, we have two young women working on the shore team, and, and they, I, I, I nabbed them from a, a, their companies they were working from. And their description of what sexism in the workplace looks like now was, for me, really horrifying because what we had to deal with was easier, because it was, it was full frontal. It was, you can't do this. There was no social media. You know, we weren't trolled. We weren't called the dreadful things online that girls are called for daring to stick their head above the parapet. We, we faced it front on, which is easy. You just punch them or you, you, know, you argue. But what these girls have to deal with is more subtle. And I think it's, it's more insidious. And you know, people know they can't say certain things now, so it becomes it takes a different form, and I think that's harder to fight. So that worries me a bit. What I would say to anyone, not just young women, is best piece of advice my mum ever gave me. All my great advice comes from my mum. I do to keep telling my daughter that. Um, keep moving forwards. You know, nothing, nothing comes to you really. You know, success is not going to come to you. Confidence is not going to come to you. You have to keep moving forwards. And even if you're not going in the right direction, it doesn't matter. Keep putting one foot in front of the other. And you know, when you haven't got a job, it's really hard to find a job. I mean, you've got a job, oh my goodness, I'm being bombarded. And, and that's you know the sort of the theory behind that, that is if you keep moving, something will happen. It's impossible for it not to. Even if you're going in the wrong direction, you'll be at a place where you can go, oh, th there it is. That's my path over there, and, and you, you can move off. And the other piece of advice I would say is don't be a bystander in your own life. You know, you're supposed to play the lead role. So get on with it. Do you have a, a routine or a regimen that helps you to keep moving forward, that helps you to keep putting one foot in front of the other, no matter sort of what's happening around you or in the world? I guess I always have a vague plan, but it is vague. I don't. I don't work well having straight lines to deal with, and, and no one lives life in a straight line. It's messy and wiggly and windy, and we often end up where we don't expect to. Um, I, I guess, no, I don't have a, I have a goal. I always have a goal. So it, used, it was Maiden, then it was to put the first all-female crew together to sell non-stop around the world, to break the non-stop around the world record. Then it was to put the first mixed gender team together. Now it is to sail maiden around the world, raising funds and awareness for girls' education. So there's often not a plan, but there's a there's I know where, where, what that goal is, even if I have to meander around for a while to, to get there. Amazing. Uh, the film is so beautiful. Congratulations. Uh, wonderfully told. How can people see it? Uh, it's uh, released in uh, New York on uh, Friday, J June 28th, uh, Landmark Theatre, um, mm. uh, and uh, then it rolls out across the country for uh, dates after that. Amazing. Everybody give a huge round of applause for Alex Holm and Tracy Edwards. Let's Thank hear Thank you. Thank you.